you have your Bible this morning, turn over to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, we are going to begin with verse 27 today. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, the Bible says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Would you pray with me this morning before we get started? God, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful day. I thank you for all those uh, that are here. I thank you that you've given us your word uh, and, and this opportunity to come together and, and worship you. And hear what you would have to say to us from your word today. God, I pray that you would do the work here that you want done. I pray that you would give me the words to say. Um, and that in all, all that we do here, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as Pastor Rob uh, reminded us uh, at the beginning of the service this morning, as I'm sure most of you are already aware, hopefully this has not come to uh, to us as, as a surprise to you, 2017 is almost over. Uh, matter of fact, a little more than 12 hours from now, almost 14 hours from now, it will be, uh, it will be done. And I can remember as a kid how long it seemed until the next year would come. Like we would sit up and we would watch the, uh, it, it was like as a kid, it was like one of the few times that I got to stay up till midnight Something about it when you're a kid that's like a magical hour that doesn't, like you hear about, but it doesn't really exist because your parents never let you stay up that late. That was the one time that I got to stay up that late to watch this glowing ball fall in uh, uh, New York City. Got to watch that on television. My parents never would take me there in person, as you can imagine if you've ever watched it. Um, and we, weren't, we never went to any of the things that we did in the South that marked that occasion. Um, if you've ever been down south, I could tell you some places to go where you could have a halfway decent time on New Year's Eve. Instead of watching things like a ball drop, you, there's little towns you can go to where they drop possums instead. <laughs> uh, and some of you are thinking, I'm actually making that up. I promise you I am not. Uh, that was like the one night a year that I got to stay up late and watch all this happen, and then it would seem it would, it would be so long until the next one would roll around. As a child, it, it, it seems like that. Whether it's uh, Christmas passing, birthday passing, that summer break, right? The most wonderful time of year for a child, the summer break. They go by so fast, and then it seems like it takes so long for the next one to come. But then as you get older those things start to happen faster and faster and faster. And before long, it's this one passes and it's not going to be long before the next one comes. And it's easy for that to happen in those events, but it's also easy for that to happen with church too, with ministry. It is not long into a year before we are starting to plan for stuff for next year. Matter of fact, just over the past few weeks, I can tell you from personal experience, some of the things that I have, that, that I have been planning or preparing for are things like uh, Winter Jam, the Iwana Grand Prix, Vacation Bible School, Church Camp. Like so, Some of y'all don't know all those things, and then I said Vacation Bible School, and you're like, really? Yeah, that was at the start of this month, end of last month, when we start preparing for things like that. And so we start preparing for them so far in advance because we have to, don't get me wrong. And then they come, they're over, and it's like the next one, it's time to start it again. 
And we, it's easy to get into that routine. It's easy to get comfortable doing those things until the next round comes that a lot of times we don't ever realize the danger that is with that because the danger is massive when we just let time fly. We just check off the next thing on the list. We just get into that routine and we get comfortable. The danger is things become comfortable. Oh, don't get me wrong. We can do things good. We can get used to them. But things just get so comfortable and easy that we never shoot for great. Eventually, what we find ourselves doing is just going through the motions. Now, yes, I mention that as a church concern. As a pastor, I mention that as a, a concern for ministry, as a concern for what we do here. But we all know that this is not the only place where something like that is a concern. Getting to where we're comfortable, things are good, they're okay, we're just going through the motions, and we're just checking them off until we get to the next one. That happens in marriages. How many marriages get to the point where, well, we just kind of drifted apart. They get comfortable. How many times does that happen with our kids? Or their jobs? Or with school? It happens in so many different areas where we get comfortable, we get good, we get that routine going, and then one day, years later, we look up and wonder, what happened? Where did all of it go? This morning, what we're going to talk about is how, how to prevent that. This is a goal that I, I've got personally for myself, for uh, the ministries that I am uh, involved in here at church. It's a goal I think we all should have. The title of this message this morning is Making 2018 Count. Because as a church, if God grants you and I one more year, I believe we should want to make the most of it. So, how do we do that? How do we keep from getting in this cycle of routine, checking the next event, the next year, the next uh, big thing off the list to get to the next one? How do we keep from settling for good, settling for comfortable, and shoot for what God all that God has planned for us. That's what the Apostle Paul addresses here in the book of Philippians, chapter 1. Look back at verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. This is where it starts. And we're going to pick this passage apart. We're going to see all that uh, God has for us here this morning. And it begins with, if we do not want to just have a just another year go by, just another round of events, just another calendar to check off. If we do not want 2018 to be that and we actually want to strive for all that God has, it begins here, according to this passage, with a God-sized mission. A God-sized mission. We are called here in this passage in many places throughout the Bible to live our life in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. And when this passage says your manner of life, what it is referencing here is, it's, it, if you take the Greek and bring it over to our English today, it's actually a reference to our citizenship. Because if you are a child of God, you realize that you do not belong to this earth anymore. You are actually a citizen of heaven according to what the Bible says. So what he's saying here is let your citizenship be worthy of the gospel of Christ. If you break this down even further, when he talks about the gospel, consider what he is saying. Consider the ramifications of the gospel. And we do not have time this morning to dive into all the details of that. But in case you have never heard the gospel, let me just share with you that for just a second. You and I are sinful, wretched, evil people, according to what God's word says. According to the standard God has laid out, none of us are righteous, none of us are good, none of us are holy. As a matter of fact, because of our sin, you and I deserve death, and we deserve to be separate from a holy God for eternity. There is none of us that can be good in God's eyes on our own. We can try, many do try, but we fail. But God, in the person of Jesus Christ, decided to do something about that. Since we could not. He left heaven to come down to this earth to live for you and me, but more importantly to die for you and me. 
to pay for those sins that you and I committed. And not just the sins, we get this idea that we do bad things, and the Bible says, yes, we do. We're sinners because of our actions, but we're sinners because of our nature. This is who we are, and we can do nothing about that. But God, in the person of Jesus, came to pay for that sin that you and I have, to die for those, and then the third day, rise from the dead in order to defeat death. So that now all those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ can be saved. And instead of wearing the evil that you and I deserve, the sin that you and I deserve, the shame you and I deserve, we get to put that off and put on the righteousness of Christ. And that's how God sees us. And we can live our life as forgiven children of God, knowing that there is nothing on heaven or in heaven, or on earth, or under the earth that can ever separate us from the love of God. Once we are His child, we are His child forever and ever and ever. We are made new, and we can be right and have a right relationship with Him. And one day when this life is over, we will be made perfect, just like we were originally intended to be, and we will get to live with God forever and ever. When the Bible says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel, it is speaking of our citizenship And it's also speaking of that gospel, not any other gospel. This is only found in Jesus. And if you have trusted in Jesus, then all those things we just talked about are true for you. And you are a child of God. You are a citizen of heaven. And what this passage is saying is our God-sized mission is to live in a manner that is worthy of that. Obviously, there is not one of us in here that deserves that. Worthy does not mean deserve What he is saying in here, we are to live our life in such a way that is an appropriate response for that being given to us. We are to live our life in such a way that it reflects that, right? If whenever I I, I leave this country, whenever I'm in a different country, if you're in a different country, whoever, whoever it is, we tend to stand out, right? Especially me, especially me, because I talk different, right? I can blend in with some English speakers until I open my mouth. Right? When I used to work for, uh, for Allstate year, years ago, uh, Allstate outsourced their technical help for, it, for their agents. They weren't in the States anymore. So whenever we would call, we didn't get uh, somebody that was in the Middle East, somebody that was in Asia. They outsourced it to Ireland, which I had never heard of. But there were times I would call and I would talk to someone And we would get the problem fixed, and then we would just sit there and talk because I liked listening to them talk, and they liked listening to me talk. Uh, We tend to stand out, especially me. Why? Because I'm from the South, and I'm an American. You guys tend to stand out because you're an American, and what we are expected to do when we leave this place is to carry that well. right? Whenever I was a child, I was expected whenever I left my home to represent my home well. Whenever I leave this church, I'm expected to represent this church well as one of its pastors and as one of its members. Whenever I was an athlete in high school and we would go to a different school, our coaches actually cared about how we behaved because we represented the school that we were coming from. This is even more serious than that, but it's talking about the same thing. If you are a child of God, what this is saying is, Act like it. If you are a child of God, you have been bought with a price. You have been born again. You are a citizen of heaven. If I go out as an American and I go to a different country and I start serving that other country, selling out my own, that's called treason, right? And you, that, that's a pretty serious like crime and offense. Whenever I leave here and I don't act like a Christian, I don't act like I've been bought with a price, I don't act like God left heaven to come down and die for me when I could do nothing of my own, much less deserve it, how is that anything other than treason against the one who did that? We're called here, if you want to, ha- if you want to make your, a year, a life, a day, a moment count, he is saying here you need to have a God-sized goal, and that is to live your life worthy of the gospel so the question is am i doing this is the way i live my life appropriate for all that god has done to me or am i just too comfortable in my walk with him 
Is it really appropriate for a Christian to think they're living for God if they just try to live a moral life? Is that really all that there is? Or let's pick another big one in, in Western Christianity today. Let's, let's talk about money. If I'm really a good steward with my money, is that really all there is to living for God? If I go to church, is that really all there is to living for God? And I'm not saying any of those by themselves are not important. What I am saying is, is that really all there is? Or if I do, if that, is that just settling for good? Is that really living our life as an appropriate response for what God has done to us, done for us? If I'm a Christian, I need to start acting like it. Each and every day. Well, fortunately, God doesn't just give us what to do. He goes on and He tells us exactly how to do it. He doesn't just give us the God-sized goal. He gives us the God-ordained method. Here's His method. All right, let's, pay, let's go back to this passage. Same verse. Philippians 1, 27, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Now, you have to understand when you read the New Testament, the majority of these books in the New Testament are actually letters to different churches two different groups of people, or to cities and the different churches within those cities. And this is no exception. This is a letter written to a specific church in a specific location. So when he's talking here about standing firm in one spirit, one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, there is more than one person reading this. That is the only way this sentence makes sense. So what is he saying? Part of the method to living our life in a manner that is worthy of the gospel is to have a unified relationship. He is talking here, ladies and gentlemen, about the church and just how important the church is. Not the church in the sense of the universal church where if I'm a child of God and you're a child of God and the person living in the hut in Africa is a child of God and the person worshiping underground in North Korea is a child of God that we're all a part of the church. That is true, but that's not the sense he's talking about here. He would be talking about the sense that Lighthouse Baptist Church is a church. And what he is saying when he says this is that you and I are to be unified in our relationship. We are to be living for Jesus together. We are to be living for Jesus together. You cannot live life to its fullest apart from the church. You have heard me say, and as a matter of fact, I just referenced it a minute ago. You have heard me say before several times, that please do not think coming to church makes you a Christian. Please do not think coming to church makes you saved. And I have referenced that several times because that is a big problem in our, in our culture today, in, in the Western church. But also, please don't ever misunderstand what I'm saying. Don't put words in my mouth that I have not said. The church is vitally important. What we do here, the reason that we have a church, the reason for for this being here, for the mission that we're on, the reason that this message is even being preached at all, that God would put this in here, is because God cares about the church. God cares about you. And you cannot live life to the fullest for the glory of God by yourself. Nobody in the New Testament is ever expected to surrender their life to Jesus and go do life on their own. God never intended for us to do things on our own. That's why he gave us the church. And just a few references, when you read the New Testament, God has told us that it is from his church that he gets glory. He told us in the book of Hebrews that it is actually sinful for you to neglect to be a part of his church. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We are to be unified as one body living this life together. As a matter of fact, Jesus told us that the way the world is going to know that we are his disciples is not how we treat the rest of the world. It's how we treat each other, how we do life together. You want to be a witness and you actually want to live your life worthy of the gospel, you're going to see in just a minute that's going to require you to be a witness. One of the ways, one of the primary ways you are a witness is how you do things here, how you do things with your brother and sisters in Christ in God's church. God cares about this. 
And we have to be unified in our, in our relationship. He says here, standing firm in one spirit, immovable. Now, we also know that that is not always easy to do, right? Because you put roughly 300 people together in one place. You put two people together in one place. Eventually, they're going to disagree over some stuff, right? That's going to happen. We disagree over things. Awesome. We're human beings. This, the church is like this novel thing that God has done where he's taken a bunch of sinful people, imperfect people, put them all together in one spot, and told them to work as one body. And that is entirely impossible without him. But with God, we can. With God, we can. And we are expected to stand unified as one body with one mission. He says here, look back again at verse 27, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. You and I are called to strive together. And when he says strive side by side or strive together, depending on your translation, that's the same Greek word that we get our word athletics from. The idea is teamwork. That's the idea he's presenting here. We are to strive, work together as a team for the faith of the gospel. Now we're getting down to the nitty gritty. Now we're getting down to why we are here. Now we are understanding what this big mission is all about that God has given his church. And that is that you and I are to come together as one body, unified as one person, unified as the church for the faith of the gospel. It is our job to reach as many people as possible. It is our job to reach the schools that we go to, the communities that we live in, the jobs that we attend, our families. It's our job to reach the, all the nations according to Jesus. We got an awesome uh, uh, toolbox of things that we can use to make that happen. We've got a church. Bring them here. Bring them here. You, you, you know me well enough. You certainly know Pastor Rob well enough to know that if somebody comes here and they're going to listen to a sermon, they're going to hear the gospel, right? You come here, you're going to hear the gospel. Bring them here. Go to them because you guys know the gospel too. Whatever it takes, whether it's bring people in or whether it's go to where they're at, we are to strive to reach as many people as we can because this is the central, primary, number one mission of the church to reach people for Jesus. That is what we are here to do. Anything that falls outside of that is not our mission. Anything that allows us to do that mission better is what we should be striving for. And the risk of getting too comfortable, the risk of not understanding this is our goal the risk of understanding or not understanding that this is why we come together is that we get so comfortable in just doing things that we lose sight of the people that those things were originally designed to reach. Sometimes things reach people during a certain time and then they don't reach them later. Does that mean that we keep doing things because it worked once before? Sometimes things don't make sense. Does that mean that we shouldn't try them to try to reach people? Or that if we try them and we try to reach people and it doesn't work, should we still keep doing it just hoping that it will one day? No, the point is that we're not supposed to get comfortable, so comfortable that we lose sight of the people that are dying and going to hell over our comfort. We're supposed to come together as one and strive, work for, as a team, to reach as many people as we can. And when he says strive together, when he says side by side, when he says as a team, that implies that each and every person in God's church has a job to do. Not just me, not just Pastor Rob, not just our Sunday school teachers, shine directors, deacons, those that stand at the door and greet. It, all of us have a job to do. None more important nor, or less important than the next. But if we're supposed to come together as one body, every, body, every part of that body's got to be working. So the question is, what are you doing? The question is, are you doing what God has called you to do 
to reach the world, to reach your community, to reach the nations, to work as part of His church, as part of His body, to reach people? Or are you doing anything? I'm not saying that all of us are called to serve in the exact same way. I'm not saying that God expects you to stand up here at a pulpit with a Bible and some notes uh, and, and deliver a sermon. Or that God expects you to go back and teach a Sunday school class. Or that God expects, I'm not saying God expects you whatever God expects you to do. That's between you and Him. What I am saying is, is when God calls you to be His child, whenever you say yes to Jesus... And you are a citizen of heaven. You are supposed to act like it. And part of acting like a citizen of heaven is serving the way God has called us to serve. So if we're not serving God, I am not acting like a citizen of heaven. And all I've done is I've taken the salvation God has offered, but I have not taken the lordship that he demands. And that is a problem. There is no way we can live our life the way God has called us to live it if we're going to try to live that way. I'm not saying that God exactly how God has called you to serve, but I am saying God has called you to serve Him. And sadly, there's a lot of Christians that will not step out of their comfort zone to try to reach anybody for Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I know there's some people that it's hard for each one of us to reach. Right? I've got family members that I will literally turn to mush whenever I talk to them about the gospel. And it's my job to tell people about the gospel. Right? That's what, one of the big things you guys pay me to do. There are people that, I, I, and I don't understand it, I don't know why. But we have to be willing to step out of our comfort zone and go reach those people. I don't know if, if you, some of you struggle with this. Maybe you're afraid of messing up. Guess what? Mess up. Mess up. You want to you come see a clinic on how different ways you can mess up doing stuff? Come hang out with me for a week. I mess up a lot. And just... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next year's lead deacon and our senior pastor. Appreciate that. Don't be afraid to mess up. You try to, you try to reach people with the gospel and you mess up doing it. What is the worst thing that could possibly happen? You're going to walk away from them. They're going to be exactly like they were when you showed up. And that is not knowing Jesus. At least you tried. Don't be afraid to mess up. You don't learn without making mistakes sometimes. Stop being okay with being comfortable. Stop being okay with that routine. We have to grasp the fact that the gospel that Jesus saved us with, He wants to save everybody else with. And without it, they are going to go to hell. If we understood, if we realized just how real hell is, how terrible it is, I don't think any of us would stop from sharing the gospel. We have, we have to have this mission. And we have to be unified in it. All of us striving to reach people with the gospel of Christ. We can argue about. We can bicker about. We can have disagreements about. The best way to go about doing that. But if our idea, our main goal is the same. And that is reaching the most people that we possibly can. With the short amount of time that we have. That's what God wants. That's what we're called to do. And we have to be willing to do this even when it gets hard. Verse 28, And not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it, is, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. We have to be willing as individuals and as a church, as one body, to suffer for this mission. As a matter of fact, here in God's Word, He says this is part of the plan. Jesus warned us of this whenever He was on this earth, building His church. He said that if any are going to be His disciples, that we have to take up our cross and follow Him. I want to let you know that there's a lot of misunderstanding in, in our churches today about what that actually means. We often get this idea that our cross to bear is any burden we want to throw out there. That our job is our cross to bear. 
that our illness is our cross to bear, that our rough marriage is our cross to bear. That is not what Jesus was talking about when he said that we have to take up our cross and follow him. What he was talking about is the persecution, the suffering that would come because of following him. Nobody in the first century would have taken that any other way. The cross was an instrument of death. It was an instrument of torture. And what he's saying is, pick that up and follow me. You have to be willing to sign up for the suffering if you're going to sign up to be my disciple. And if we have any doubts of that, just read through the New Testament and consider some of the characters that God has mentioned. People like Jesus, the apostles. Go to the Old Testament, consider the widow with Elijah, the children of Israel in Egypt. The man that Jesus healed that was born blind to go to our Sunday school lesson from just a week ago. What do all those people have in common? They all suffered according to the plan of God. It wasn't just that God used their suffering for his glory. It's that their suffering was actually part of the plan. That's kind of scary. We have to be willing for that. Willing for that to come. We have to be willing to set aside our comfort for that. Most of us in here who are married, I say most, wives, I know for my own wife sometimes you debate this. Most of us in here who are married would, without hesitation, lay aside our own life lay aside our comfort, give up everything that we ever own or ever would own, voluntarily live destitute or even die to save the life of our spouse. We would absolutely do that. I would do that in a heartbeat. Do we love Jesus that much? Are we sold out like that? Would we be willing to do that? For our faith in Him? You know, there's places around the world where people, they go to church services, they worship God by digging, by by going into holes in the ground where they normally hide vegetables and stuff in, in certain poor countries. They'll go down there so that they don't get caught. They'll face death and torture because they refuse to say no to Jesus. Do we love Jesus that much? Are we sold out that much? Are we willing to actually suffer to part with things? Are we willing to suffer loss for this gospel? Because from what it says here, if I'm going to live my life worthy of the gospel, I've got to be willing. Listen to this letter. This is one of the letters that has stirred me. Probably more than, well, more than any other I had written, and it doesn't even involve me. It's written, it's written hundreds of years ago. It's a letter that some of you may have read or heard this before. It's a letter that a missionary, Adoranam Judson, wrote to the wife, or to the excuse me, to the father of a lady named Anne Hazeltine. Anne was a lady he wanted to marry. And so he wrote his prospective father-in-law to ask for permission to ask for his daughter's hand in marriage. And this is the letter that he wrote. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God, Can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness, brightened by the acclamations of praise which shall resound to her Savior from heathens saved, through her means, from eternal woe and despair? Now, 
Um, as having a, a daughter myself, um, that is not how I would expect her future husband to come and ask me about it. Um, if you know this story and you've read the rest of it, if, you, if you've ever studied things like this, you know he said yes to that. He said yes. And you know that Anne Hazeltine, that would become Anne Judson, signed up for it and that she did in fact die. This missionary life cost her her life. It cost their children's lives. It cost his next wife her life. It cost him his life eventually. But that's what being sold out for the gospel looks like. A willingness to go through that. A willingness to suffer for the cause of Christ. A willingness to put my own self aside and what I want to go reach somebody else for Jesus Christ. And as a church, that is our job. That is our goal. That is our number one primary mission. And if we want to make 2018 count, we have to realize that. And if that means that this isn't working to get that accomplished, we have to stop and do something different, awesome. That's what we do. If it means that this works... So let's keep doing it, then that's what we do. If it means that I have to step outside and go to the people that I don't really want to go to, then that's what we do. Look at the results. The Bible says that if we are willing to do this, have a God-sized mission and follow His ordained method to make this happen, that we will grow. He says in verse 30, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now here that I still have. What Paul is saying is, look, this is how I've done things and you saw it. Everything that I've told you to do, I've already done and you saw it. And now you're hearing that I still do it the same way. Listen to what happened as Paul is sitting in prison writing this letter. Listen to the the, the end result of the Apostle Paul being willing to live like this. Philippians chapter 1, go back to verse 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ and most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry but other others from goodwill the latter do it out of love knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition Not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. The Apostle Paul says, if you live this way, guess what? More people are going to hear about Christ. You're not just going to be some other church down the road who's just doing things on Sundays and Wednesdays. People are going to start to take notice. People are going to see it. People are going to hear about this Jesus, and more people are going to be talking about this Jesus. Then listen to what he says. This, this, is, this is great. So it's, it's subtle. It's almost hidden. In chapter 4, verse 21, right at the end when he's closing this letter out to the church, listen to what he says. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Now, little history. Caesar at this time, not a big fan of Christians. Um. Cutting heads off, lighting people on fire, uh, blaming Rome's destruction on on Christians, things like that. Not, Not their number one fan. What the Apostle Paul is saying is, because I went through all this, the people in this dude's house are coming to faith in Christ. It is people you would not expect. How do you reach those? Like I remember uh, as a young pastor and, and listening to people uh, uh, that, that had done this a lot longer than I have and listening to other preachers and hearing about the, 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 the town drunk that would get saved, hearing about the meanest guy on the block that would get saved. How do things like that happen? Because people are more sold out for Jesus than they are themselves and are willing to do whatever it takes to get the gospel in front of people. Do all those people say yes to Jesus? No. But that's the only way those kind of things happen. When you look at the Apostle Paul's life, consider those that he actually got to witness come to faith in Jesus. People like a Roman governor, Caesar's household, a Jewish priest, a Roman soldier who guarded a prison, a rich Gentile woman, a young man who was raised in a uh, half-pagan home 
by a Christian mom and a Greek dad become a pastor one day? Do we think that we would have any other results? Do we think that we would see anything different if we live sold out for Jesus? Do we expect to not see people come to Jesus if we live this way? Because all throughout the Bible, that's the way it's been. When people are sold out for Jesus, when people are willing to sacrifice of themselves to see people come to faith in Jesus, when people are willing to step out of their comfort zone and not just be comfortable and get in the routine and try to reach the world for Jesus, that people actually come to Jesus. Now, part of the problem is there are some of you in here, and I have been there too, there are some of you in here that have such a dislike for someone else that you border, if not, are way over the border on hating them. There are some of us in here that struggle with things like that. There are people in here that don't like other people because of how they live, because of their sexuality, because of their background, because of their race, because of their political affiliations, because of the letter at the end of their name whenever they go vote. This book makes it clear all throughout that Jesus died for each and every one of those people. And we have to stop with that attitude. I am sick and tired of seeing things put on Facebook, hearing things said, seeing how people act, where we will put down somebody else because of their religion, because of how they vote, because of the color of their skin. Jesus died for those people too. He died for those awkward kids in your school. He died for that family member that nobody else wants to be around. He died for the people on the other side of the world. He died for each and every one of them just like you and me. They don't deserve Jesus and neither did I, but Jesus saved me anyway and then he told me to go tell them about him. And it's time we start putting more of our efforts into be, instead of being comfortable, instead of getting some agenda done, instead of keeping everything routine so that we are comfortable it's time we start putting more of our efforts into reaching some of those people who don't know jesus and put more of our efforts into being one body and loving each other like god told us to because without that the rest of the world is not going to see the jesus that we are supposed to be supposed to be showing them so how do we do this as we go into 2018 how do we do this keep jesus first in all that we are, in all that we do, our lives, in this church, even if it means loss, even if it means suffering, even if it means giving up comfort. That's, that's my prayer every day is Jesus use me just as your instrument, whatever it takes, what, whatever. Keep Jesus first. That also includes knowing and being obedient to his word. It's what the Bible calls being a disciple. Being an imitator of Jesus. Being a follower of Jesus. And then, not only, am I just, not only do we just do that, but we go and we reach others. We make disciples. We get the gospel out. We share this message. We train those who have said yes to Jesus so that they can go and reach other people. So that they can go and tell other people about Jesus. It's not my job. It's not primarily my job to go tell your mom and your dad, your brother and your sister, your cousin, your neighbor about Jesus. It's not. That's yours. It's not Pastor Rob's job. It's yours. If you're a child of God, you have everything that you need to go tell somebody else about Jesus. Could you have more? Sure. Could you, could you have more experience? Sure. Could you have more knowledge of God and His Word? Sure. But the first evangelist in all of the Bible was a woman who had been married five times and now was living, like, shacked up with somebody she wasn't married to. She said yes to Jesus and she didn't know much about him at all except that he was the Messiah and she ran back to her town and got half of them to follow Jesus and got the other half to at least come listen to him. You ain't, ain't got to know a whole lot. It's our job to be a disciple of Jesus then go and reach others so that they can be disciples of Jesus too. We began 2017 with, as you can see, a heart, a desire to know him and to make him known. And you have heard several times over the last few weeks, even more specifically, how we're going to go about doing that. Being disciples of Jesus. 
Now, I want you to understand in what we talk about being a disciple of Jesus, being a follower of him, being an imitator of him, living life the way he would live it, being surrendered to him. We often make a distinction that between a believer and a disciple. Like, I can say yes to Jesus and I'm a believer, but then over here, they're the super Christians that are actually the disciples of Jesus. When the New Testament makes no distinction at all, if you are a believer of Je- in Jesus, you are commanded to be a disciple. You don't get to sign up for the salvation without signing up for the other stuff too. We are called to be disciples. That's how we know him. And then we're called to make him known. We're called to make disciples. Reach other people. This is our number one job. And going into 2018, what my goal is for the children's ministry, for the youth ministry here at church, is we're not going to do anything just to stay comfortable. And we may get some stuff wrong. We may mess some stuff up. But that's okay. Because our job is to go and reach as many people as we can. And so we want to strive for that. We want to do that. I want to do that myself. And that is what I want to lead our kids to do. And that's what this church is going to be doing to reach for all God has for us, to reach for this goal. Yeah, it may be different or uncomfortable, but we're going to go where God leads because God is often found in the uncomfortable. He's often found in the difficult. That's where he gets the most glory.